I want to welcome everyone here to our Wednesday night service. I'm Rusty Pike. For those of you who don't know or are watching online, and finishing up on uh, part two of our uh, on our lesson: good news, bad news, fake news. And just to do a little review from the uh, week before last, uh, of course, we talked about news and what news is, and you know, that's just information that someone's trying to convey to you to get over a point or to enlighten you or to whatever. And, you know, from a historical standpoint, I'm not sure that oh my God. we didn't, uh, uh, that we were, we were getting the straight news for the most part. Of course, you now lies have been told since the beginning, but uh, I think as it, particularly more recently, we're seeing, and unfortunately, a lot of the news is, is not fact driven or truth driven, it's agenda driven. Um, no, whether there's something that's true or not is not on the priority list. It's, is this in furtherance of what we're trying to accomplish? What are we trying to get these people to believe or do or act or refrain from acting as it has been doing? Um, which is, is, in the big picture, is deception. First, First Timothy 3.13 talks about and in sort of these state of our times, people deceiving, or watching any of the, particularly the cable news and a lot of the regular news, they're deceiving. But I'm not so certain that, as the verse says, and also being deceived, it's sort of a circular thing where we have um, lies and half truths. Of course, we know who the father of the lies and the half truths is. And, and of course, the worst lie, or I guess what, what's the worst to me is, and probably the worst is, when you have facts, truth, that is taken out of context. And I don't know if you've paid much attention to it the last couple of weeks, but since we were here last, I've kind of paid attention to a little bit of the news in light of what we've been discussing. You know, several instances where a certain fact was asserted, or audio clip or video clip, that really happened. And then somebody, but then there was a part two or the comma, but, well then when somebody went to replay it as news, they only played the first part and it created this impression like, I can't believe that person said that. Well, the person said that, but it was in the context of a greater conversation that once you heard the second part, it gave the first part a, a totally different meaning. And I think that's what we're, what we're looking at, because as we talked about um, the agendas and the, the two agendas, if you will, and what, what tools does the devil have? What tools is the devil breaking out? Well, he's breaking out lies. That's all his children. <coughs> lies, greed, and pride. Pride and greed, sort of, and the love of money type of thing. Of course, we, we talked about last time, First Timothy 16, the love of money the root of all evil, or all types of evil. And some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith, which means that's not just a believer or a non-believer issue, it's a believer issue as well. I think we've seen over time where some fairly prominent folks have fallen, they have longed for that greed or that power, and uh, it's that wandered away and they've been caught a lot of times in, in their wandering. Something that obviously affects both sides. So we talked about fake news and well, what is that fake news? What, what is fake news? And I talked about being a sign of the times or pointing to the times that we are in. And the headlines, you know, we looked at um, Matthew 24, 2 Timothy 3, that have all these descriptions of what, you know, Matthew 24, they asked Jesus for. Hey, what's going to be sign for the sign? Uh, 2 Timothy, Paul talks about things that are happening in, in the end days and in the difficult times. And so we look at those, and, and again, we get back to um, you know, are we in the last days, or are we in the end times, or the end of the last days? You know, I don't think it takes, you can watch TV, listen to the news, read the newspaper, and it's not hard to tell. But ultimately, there's two agendas out there. There's that John 10.10, 10, the devil has come to kill, kill and destroy, and God's come that we might have life and death. Life and death. And you know, you're not going to see death 
it's going to be making it look like it's something that it is, that deception part of it. Because really, there's two agendas, there's two paths, there's two ways to look at that. Yeah. 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 Ye
out there, and I think there's a whole lot of people that do it, and we support a lot of people that do that. Uh, but preaching that good news, of course, there is bad news. You know, we talked a lot about the bad news last time. Uh, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God, the way that sin is set. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. The wicked shall be turned into hell. The nations that forget God shall be turned into hell. Of course, here's, here's one of those out of context kind of things. The wages of sin is death. Well, if you stop right there, you think, well, how? We read it in totality, put it into context. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life with God, with Him. Um, so again, what should we be doing if we're believers? What are we supposed to be doing with this good news? Mark 16, 15 says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel as to what we should be doing. And you know, we talked a little bit last time about, well, you know, my poor brother, I don't know if I can do that. I'm fearful or I don't speak well or I'm afraid or uh, some of that is just Doubt number length we have to get over and deal with. Some of it's some of it's real. Some of us have talents and ability to do certain things. Some of us have a reluctance because we don't want to be sent in sort of a hypocrite. We looked at Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. It talks about the hey, before you go to get into the splinter out of your buddies, uh, tend to the I'm sorry, are we out? We doing good? Mm -hmm. I thought you were signaling me for something. Oh. <laughs> Um, and there's some honesty, and I think some honesty in that you kind of have to know where you are to be able to relate to other people. But then we talked about in you know, the Romans 12, verse 2, be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In 2 Timothy 2, study and show thyself the truth. So I guess in one respect of what should we be doing, you know, or what should we, each individual, be doing? You know, should we, as we talked about, sweep, back, sweep around our own back door? Because we certainly, I've seen this happen a bunch of times. I guess I might call it a pain of mine. Uh, when you see people that are maybe maybe well-intentioned, I suppose, but they're condemning or judgmental as to other people, particularly those that they that they perceive are, are not believers. And I think you know, there's a, we can have a problem with uh, this again is sort of the beam and splinter analogy of you know, we try to point to things in people's lives or people we may be trying to witness to or to impress you know, upon or persuade. Things that maybe perhaps about their habits or whatnot. You know, we're, we're trying to persuade them, but I think we're trying to persuade them about something that's really not a disqualified. Uh, you know, because if we start off with telling people the things they need to stop doing, not only is it a turnoff for them, you know, they, you may easily get rebuffed and that may be an opportunity lost. But sometimes I think it's, you know, it's really sometimes inconsistent with what God's word really has to say. Matthew 15, 11 says, It's not what goes into the mouth of the man who defiles him, but what comes out of his mouth that defiles him. Now that's not to say that you know, there are certain habits or things that are not bad for you or, or good ideas to change and things. But, and I think Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians. Is 10 says, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial or advantageous. All things are lawful, but not all things are constructive uh, to character or edifying as a spiritual life. Again, that's not to say that things we might perceive in others might not really be things that they need to, to address, but I think we need to be careful with not trying to, as I said last time, baptize folks before they get saved. Basically, clean them up. Okay. We you need to get you cleaned up, and then I think it's the other way around. Let's do whatever we can do to get them saved. They I broke this. Let's get them in the barn before the gates close. Uh, because you know, people I think in Europe they think kind of what issues they have or what habits they have that may not be beneficial to them. But you know, I think we need to get them saved, and then we can encourage them to work on those worldly things themselves. Uh, that's that renewal, that transforming, that not being informed, but being renewing your mind, that studying that. And that's something the individual kind of has to do themselves because if you, you confront people, people are defensive, and that might, like I said, maybe a lost opportunity, maybe the only opportunity to 
you may have. So we're back to well, what can I do? Well, as Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And again, that's what you might realize. Well, that's not me. I have this to do. I have a job. I've got kids. I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good example or whatnot. Uh, again, some of that's rooted in doubt and unbelief, and we need to address that. Some people, some people have a knack for certain things. Some don't. Um, and of course, the truth is not everyone's the same. We have different personalities, different abilities. But, but, but God, Jesus didn't say go. <laughs> but we're taking a look at where, where go and all that con different context to kind of maybe to encourage you. I'm not doing a good job of filling my, my commission to go into all the world. We're going to look at that word go. In Luke chapter 7, it's a very familiar I'll tell you about it. The account of the centurion with the, the servant that was as, as most of you know, the centurion uh, had a sick servant. Uh, had been good to the Jewish people. I think he said he had built a synagogue out of his own money. So he sent some of the guys and says, hey, you're going to get Jesus. Let me pray for my servant. And Jesus said, well, you know, we're going to And so he's on his way. The centurion sends word again and says, hey, look, I'm not worthy for Jesus to come here. And he doesn't have to come here personally because I get it. He doesn't have to say it exactly all he has to say. But he just tell him he just needs to say the word and my servant will be healed. Of course, and now the, the main idea of that of the verse there, the story that he's telling there is that the centurion recognizes Jesus' authority. But he also recognized and sort of what sort of impressed Jesus, I think, was that that this command could be carried out in sort of a different format or a different manner. He understood the command structure and the teamwork aspect, if you will. Because, you know, he went on to say, he said, look, I'm a man under authority. I'm a soldier. And I get orders. I give orders. I tell one man to go. There's that word. And what does he do? He goes. I say to one, come, and he comes. And I say, hey, do this, and he does that. Jesus talked about how great effect. And it's sort of that, you know, when the word comes down from headquarters, in this case, Jesus is telling us go. It's not, it's directed to everyone, but it's not just directed to us alone. You know, we, there's several references where we talk about the body of Christ, and we are parts of the body, we're all parts of the body. Um, and then different people have different parts of play. But all in furtherance of the same directive. So back to our centurions, the centurion got the word, hey, I need you to go take the next city. Well, that wasn't centurion all by himself doing that. He had other people, and maybe not him even going at all. But he could still go and accomplish the goal. And that's kind of what I'm going to get to, is that you know, not everyone can go. Mm -hmm. We all have the limitations. Somebody's got to you know, mind the store, so to speak. But we can all play a part. Of course, you know, we're not necessarily talking about the mission, I'm talking about the mission field, but not necessarily the overseas mission field. And, and you know, that's a certainly important part of it. We're blessed to be able to refer or to support Dr. Martin, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Wood, and Brazos, and Marie China. Because every time they come here and we give, that's, we're on the credit for whatever they have going on there and wherever they're doing it. Somewhere, wherever the list is being checked, that's a check in our column every time that we do. We're not going there, but we're basically just like the centurion says. Hey, I say to Third Wood, go. And he goes. And he accomplishes what he's out there to do. He's accomplishing or fulfilling that revenue. Going into all the world. It's not geography, and it's not just distant lands. Of course, it's right here in our own community. You know, the, the people that you're around is sort of, you know, in your world. You've heard people sometimes usually describe it as funny when you describe a person or family or group and you say, you know, they're in a whole other world. Well, that's not the world I'm talking about. The world, where is the world that they're living in? Some of you that are, that are on social media, you have groups of friends and, and your friends have totally 
totally separate group. Some of them want to overlap. But there's a, there's a world there for you. Or it may be you're at your job. That little place, that little cubby, or that little uh, place that you can be that you can have an impact. That's the world that I'm talking about going into. And we might have to be creative. You can find something to catch your attention. I wrote in the morning that might be a nice topic for the next time is to talk about ways that we can be creative in putting the gospel out there. Or that what we can do in furtherance of the gospel. Well, like our live stream, right? They're a wonderful tool. You know, we have the confines of maybe having 100 people here. We could have 100 million right on the, on the live stream. But, but it doesn't just work by itself. You might think, well, hey, I'm a speaker, I'm a camera guy. So, well, I wrote some of these things. You know, somebody had to have the idea to try it. That was, a, that was a particular person who says, hey, why don't we try it? Somebody had to put up some money to buy that camera. Somebody had to put up some money, or did put up money to buy that computer. Somebody went to the store and actually bought it. That was me. I actually went to the best buy at all. <laughs> Somebody had learned about the software. There are several folks that are learning about the software. Somebody had to put up these lines. That was two totally different people because that gives a little better view online. And everybody that contributes on Sunday is part of paying for the internet service that allows us to do that. One tool, lots of helpers. One going, but a lot of people playing a part. So you can play a part regardless of what your present condition may be. I think you can play. I, 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 would, I think I should rather than say we had you or we had better play a part in doing Because we don't want to come up like this next example I'm going to make, we've talked a lot about Matthew 24. Well, following Matthew 24, Jesus sort of expounds on Matthew 24, talks about the kingdom of God, and he talks about, uh, and of course this is all one sort of continuous thing. And he's talking about what's going to happen at the end, and he's going to give some illustrations of things that we ought to be paying attention to. And again, God recognizes, you know, we all have talents, and what I'm referring to here is that, that particular talks about the, the wealthy man that had the servants, and he left him with talents. And of course now, in the story, the talents are that was some monetary form, gold, or whatever that they had. But I don't think that word is necessarily misplaced the way we kind of, the way we use the word talents. You know, we think uh, Doug has a talent uh, on the trunk. Jimmy has a talent. That's not a monetary thing, but he has an ability. He has an ability that many of us don't have. Pastor Tommy hits those drums every time he walks by. I don't know if he has a talent for the drums. <laughs> but that, so I don't think it, it, that, the use of that word, I think it's not a coincidence that that word was used there. And y'all are familiar with this story. Um, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is like a rich man who's going on a journey and his talents amongst the workers. And this is part of one of them. verse 15 says, each according to his own ability. So when the guy was leaving, and when God entrusts us to do something, or wants us to do something, he has an appreciation or understanding of what our abilities may be. Or somebody, you know, one guy got five talents. One guy got two, one guy got I thought, you know, it's something I hadn't really thought about. No one got zero. Everybody got some. One got five times more than the other one. One got twice, two and a half times as much as the other one. One got 20% less than the highest guy. But everybody got some. Of course, y'all know, you know, you know what happened. Five, got the guy with the five, turned his five into five more. And two and the two more. And here's the thing if when we read our Bible, I think it's sort of a side note. Every time I read the Bible, I see something there. I don't mind how many times I've read a particular verse of this. I bet I've read this story a hundred times. And I see something that, like there was no zero. I, that's the first time I'd ever gone on it. No, everybody got something that, that, that when he left him. Um, but each according to his own ability. And then when the boss man comes back, Five, five. And we don't want to say that 
they got sort of slapped on the back. Even though the guy, the guy with five, got, got, or the guy with two, got the same slap on the back that the guy with five did. You know, there was no competition necessarily. They, they may be competitive or amongst themselves. There's nothing wrong with you know, using one another, playing off one another if you've got a, a good purpose to it. Um, but they both got the same reward, if you will. Hey, well done. Good job. But we know what happened. But what happened to the one guy? And the boss man comes back and he says, Hey, I knew you were a tough guy. So I went and hid the talent you gave me if you're here. And, you know, and of course, what does the wealthy man say? He said, You knew what I expected. This is what I'm getting back to the, we had better be doing something. He said, You knew what I expected, but you didn't do anything. You, but you could have at least invested it with the bankers not to come back and stop the industry. What the rich man was saying is that you could have done something. You did nothing. You could have done one thing and said, hey, here's my talent, and I loan it out to somebody else. And they would have used it and multiplied it. Even maybe not as much as the five or the two, but the point of there, I think the point of the story is everybody had, he had he could have done something. Even though he might have thought, oh, I can't, or he's tough, or whatever. He didn't do it, and what happened? What he had got taken away from him. I don't know, the moral of this story is use whatever ability you have to the best of your ability. And it really doesn't matter what, you know, what we have. We might look at it, oh, Pastor Tommy, he's a, he's a five-talent guy. Miss Claudia is a five-talent person. Or, oh, well, that's just one person. Well, God doesn't look at it that way. There's numerous examples of where the way we sort of look things on the natural, in the natural eye, we think, oh, large, small, important, not so important. But look, look at uh, two examples I wrote down. The widow who gave the two mites. And everybody said, and, G and what did Jesus say? Which was totally, blew, blew their minds. He said, she gave more than Another, here's another one that made me think of it. Well, let me finish this one. The boy with the loaves and the fish. And I think there would have been two of those. You know, that's, somebody had to volunteer that up. You know, he could have very easily said, well, I'm not going to give away what I got. But he gave what he had and what happened to it? Multiplied it, multiplied it, multiplied it. Um, I don't know what I was going to say about that. Um, so again, what you know, what do we do? What can we do? We need to be doing something. So what can you do and what can we do collectively? What can each of us do individually? What can each of, what can we all do collectively? Romans 12, I want you to think about it, write it down. Go home and read it. Read it the rest of the week. It is a great chapter that sums up the positions of what we can do. This sort of answers this question, what can I do as an individual and what can I do as a collective part of a, of a greater body or a team? Romans 12, uh, I'm going to read some of it. This, this, once I start reading, it will be familiar to you. Uh, Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and well pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed and renewed by the, by the renewing of your mind. Focusing, this is a new thing, yeah, by focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. This is sort of something, well, hey, what can I do? Mind, tend to your own business is probably priority number one. Uh, going on to verse 3, uh, don't think any more highly of yourself or end up his importance and ability than he ought to think. For God has apportioned to each of us a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. For just as in one physical body we have many parts, and these parts do not all have the same function or special use, so we, who are many, are nevertheless just one body in Christ, and individually we are parts of one another, mutually dependent on each other. Since we have gifts, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, 
Each of us is to use them accordingly. So just because we have a particular thing, there's, there's no respect. God's no respect for persons. And he's no respect for talents or abilities. He understands what we may or may not have or what our capabilities may or may not be in the moment. But he's apportioned to us for each of us to use them accordingly. So if you are a server, serve. If you are a teacher, teach. If you are an encourager, encourage. If you're a giver, give. Uh, if you're a person with diligence, show diligence, show mercy. All of this sort of wraps up into enthusiastically serving the Lord. Uh, and then it goes on to bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who rejoice, live in harmony with one another. Don't be haughty, conceited, self important. This is sort of some of the flip side of what not to do. If we look back at 2 Timothy 3 and Matthew 24 of some of the descriptions of the end times. These are sort of the, the inverse of those things. Um, if by the, the, of this one, never repay evil for evil. Take thought of what is right and gracious and proper in the sight of everyone. And I thought, this, this, is, this is interesting. This is like verse 18. We'll get to it in a minute. If, if possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not be overcome uh, and conquered by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, that's a chapter we can, we can read. We can read every day, and it would be a good idea. So I want to get back to you know our topic here was good news, bad news, fake news, and um, you know we started with the news and fake news and agendas and how we have to be as the the old the little song. Was be careful, little ears, what you hear. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. You know, we need to be careful what we're seeing, careful what we're hearing, and most importantly, careful what we are focusing on. There's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with watching some new shows. Apparently, you know, as someone was saying, kind of see what they have going on over there. Um, but you need to be careful of what we're focusing on and filtering it, as we talked about last time, filtering it through the Word. And essentially, uh, as God, as Jesus admonished us, don't be deceived. You know, I've been, since in preparing for the last time and since the last you know, a couple weeks ago until now, uh, I've sort of been watching the news with sort of this, these thoughts in mind and there's a war going on out there. And not just a war of this principality. There's people on the streets. There are people looting, burning, uh, killing, uh, mayhem in the streets. And it's, you know, and we need to be aware of that. You know, just, and just because it hadn't come here to Baldwin County, thank God it hadn't come here. I mean, we've got some good leadership here in our county cities in our area, in our state. Uh, but we need to be aware of what's going on. But and looking back at, at, at verse 15 of Romans 12, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So, it, you know, well, that sort of suggests that it might become a time where it might not be impossible to live at peace with everyone. It might not be long before we are challenged in all kind of different respects. We may be challenged intellectually. Let me, put, let me start off with the easy. We may be challenged intellectually um, with you know, someone asking us to explain, and, and some it may be sarcastically or mocking us or, uh, or, or trying to, to down us. Of, oh, well, tell me something about the Bible, and it may be something difficult. You might have difficulty answering. Well, you need to be prepared. Well, how are we prepared? Well, we talk study, reading, pray, things that everybody can do. We also might be challenged. Um, you're probably, we're getting challenged a little bit now, but with some of these directives we're getting. You rightly so, with some, with some of this mask wear, some of this vaccine talk that's coming down the line. We're going to have to make decisions about those types of things. And some of them might not be Bad decisions have to make. But 
based on what we're being confronted with now, you think, okay, I can wear a mask. And no, I'm not saying I'm not wearing a mask, wear a mask, not wear a mask. Basically, use, use common sense, I think, is probably the best thing there. But if, we, if someone can persuade you to do that, and you think, no, I can do that. Might not like it, you can do that. Then what's the next thing that might be persuaded? Might be, you might not have an issue with this mask, but the next thing that might come down the pipe might be closer over there to your, you know, your, your dividing line of, well, hey, I don't know about that. Or what does the Bible say about that? Or the Bible might be telling me he's here and they're wanting me to be here, or vice versa. So we have got to be prepared, not prepared mean, doesn't mean get ready once it's here. Prepared means be ready once it's once it comes. Mm -hmm. You know, now it's it's it going to get something in the street like in money. How are we going to act if it does? You know, in Nehemiah 4, they were dealing in some pretty serious time when they went to rebuild the wall and had all their enemies surrounding them and blocking them and threatening them. And it said they were rebuilding the wall and everyone had their job to do. I'm getting back to what can we do. Well, everybody's going to have a job to do. But it also describes them as basically having a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. They were doing the good work. But they were prepared in case something came down the line. And I don't want to be an alarmist or anything, but um, I don't know, maybe I do want to be a little bit Because, you know, it might come to that. Are you prepared? If you're not, are you getting prepared? You know, here's one thing I, I, I thought. You know, it might not be in the fight. In the, well, there are fights in the streets, but there's going to be a fight at the ballot box in November, I guarantee you. And every day leading up to it, we are going to be bombarded more than we have ever experienced before with news and predominantly fake news because there's some people that have an agenda. They want it to go one way. I might say we need it to go another way. But regardless of what happens in November, because you know this November may come and go like we hope, like we, I think probably us here, hope it will go. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's going to be another November down the road. So we need to, and you know, or I guess there'll be another November. <laughs> But regardless of what happens in November, we need to sort of heed the admonition of Matthew 24. That that, that whole talks about and other other examples that talk about being alert, being ready, being awake, paying attention, um, not being deceived. And how well, how do we do all of those things? Reading our Bible. Things everybody can do. We can read our Bible. We can pray. We can stay on top of things. We can filter all those things mm -hmm. through the word as we talk about. If the state of the if the state of the news, the bad news is telling us what times are we living in. You know, let's look at Matthew twenty four and Second Timothy three and compare it to the headlines of today. Well, they're almost they're almost interchangeable. You could read some of Matthew twenty four as if it was on the front page of the you know, national paper. I think. You know, I think, I think we're here. You know, we've been, I, I've sort of heard it my whole life, if you will, and I'm sure a lot of people have kind of heard it their whole life. There's some things now in place that weren't in place back when I was a young person, where some of you were young people. Things dealing with Israel, and things, and all these other things, signs of the time. We're getting there, so what should we be doing with this? One of the most important things we need to be fulfilling that great commission. We need to go, whether that's going ourselves or supporting someone else that's going. You know, that concept of being uh, in parts of one body, it's kind of like being on, you know, kind of being on a team, if you will. What's the goal of the team? Well, the goal of the, depending on what you know, sport you're playing, I suppose, but, you know, in football, for instance, the goal of the offense is to score a touchdown. 
Um, and the people that, and a lot of times we confuse the people who, with the quarterback, gets all the glory. Well, you know, if one guy was missing off the line, I don't care how good the quarterback would be. He's going to get a disadvantage to the other team that's got all it. If the other team has 11 and you only got 10, you can have 10 of the best. But those 11 are probably going to get on you. So every, which is to say, every position is important. You know, I can remember, I mean, dad, dad was a coach, and grew up watching film, and how many times the difference between a good play and a great play quite often was person the furthest away from the ball, either doing their job or not doing their job. So let's, let's for instance, if you're familiar with, if I'm here on the line of scrimmage, and we're going to run a play down this south line, but we have a wide receiver that's way over here. So he might be tired and think, oh, I'm going to take this play. And not where his job might be, hey, your job is to get down we don't know if the guy's going to get tackled over here for a one-yard game or a five-yard game, but our goal is for, to go all the way. And go all the way on this play, ideally. But how many times did we see this guy, what we used to use the word lollygag, if y'all don't know what lollygag means. If his job was to, hey, I want you to try to get in front of that safety or keep your quarterback from... And, how many times did the backside defender doing his job hustle, hustle, hustle and make a game saving tackle, a touchdown saving tackle, all because the person who might not have thought their job was so important in this particular play didn't do their job. Or on a positive sign, you know, he runs downfield, not only gets in front of a safety, but also gets in front of somebody else and turns an ordinary play into a I think if we need to approach that as if we're the backside receiver, we need to be doing our job just like it was coming to our side if we're part of that team. You know, what should we be doing? Being the best that we can be. Number one, be the best that you can be. Because if I'm in the team concept, if I'm the best that I can be, if I'm doing the best job here, I'm going to be able to contribute much more than if I'm not doing the best that I can be. And if I'm not being the best that I can be, I'm working at being the best that I can be. Again, we talked about last week, we're not perfect. No one is perfect. But we can be works in progress, if you will. Be ready. Minding our own business. How are we, how are we going to be ready? We study, read the Bible, pray, show up. Show up online. Give, volunteer. Do something. Do something. Don't be like the guy who buried the talent. Hey, at least put it into my arms of it. At least do something. Uh, an example of somebody that do, does something. That, that, that's, a, that's probably as easy a thing to do and I've seen it my whole life. I don't think we have. I've ever been out to eat with Mother Daddy that Mother did not leave a trap. When we paid for dinner. You've been doing that for as long as I can remember. I, I don't know. Maybe I don't know if you have any stories or not. Or in, and I, but I bet you somewhere along the line, that that one little act of doing one little something made a difference. It, it was a domino that hit a domino and hit a domino that made a different impact in somebody's life. I guarantee. So, what can we do? Make sure we're, we individually are doing everything we can be doing. And then secondly, let's use whatever talent we have collectively and doing that and bringing in that harvest. You know, Matthew 9, 37, 38, you know, Bible, Jesus says the, the fields are white. The harvest is out there. If we look around in our world today, unlimited opportunities fulfilling the Great Commission every every single day, whether we're at work, at school, uh, at Walmart, at wherever we might be, there's an opportunity to do something. Because there's a job for you, there's a job for me, and there's a job for everyone. You know, to, so how do, we, how do we accomplish this? Well, we have, have a couple 
We've got to have a goal. We've got to have a vision. We've got to have a plan. Because, you know, I think that's, that's what faith is. That faith, that's kind of a hard word for some folks to understand. But to me, I think this is accurate. Faith is goal achievement thinking. You know, uh, of course, if it's something that's goal, it's not manifest here right now. You know, if I'm back to our football, if, I'm on, you know, if our goal is to score a touchdown, well, we're on the 20-yard line. We haven't scored yet. We've got a lot of mileage in between. Us. But we could need to start play one, play two, do my job. Marching forward, not giving up. Which is to say, you know, we can't just think, you know, we can't just have goal achievement thinking and then just think about it. We've got to put some... We can't just think to that thinking. We have to have some action, some work, some doing. Uh, I wrote this down because faith. Well, I didn't write this down. It's in the Bible. Faith without works is nothing for <laughs> dead. Uh, I wrote. The, I wrote this part. Faith without works is just wishful thinking. And so, uh, if I can impress upon us, upon us and all, us individually and us collectively, let's not just be wishful thinkers. Let's be hearers and let's be doers. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you watching online, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, for all those that are watching, sharing, and giving, you know, when you click that share button on there, we're sending it out to you, and then you're sending it out to everyone else that's in your world, so you're playing your part. I know I mentioned this last time, you know, we've got some people that watch us, faith, not only that faithfully watch us online, some folks that have never been here that faithful givers to support in that ministry doing their part, they might can't be here and do something, but they're doing their part in fulfilling that uh, that great commission so we sure appreciate everyone listening to us for those online uh, join us again Sunday when Pastor Tommy will be back up here in the pulpit for those who want to join us Sunday school at 9.45 we'll have Miss Vicki will have the kids' Sunday school. Miss Claudia will have her youth Sunday school. Pastor Tommy, uh, adult Sunday school. Our worship will start at 1030, and we'll be live online right about 11 o'clock. So for all of you watching, remember, God loves you, we love you, and we'll see you next time.